Well, folks, it's October. We are in Halloween season, and even if you're not able to fully enjoy the festivities of Halloween this year, you can still sit back and marvel in the splendor and the majesty of some classic WCW Halloween Havoc shows. And this week, we're going to kick off with a bang and a whimper with Halloween Havoc 1995 from Saturday, October 29th at the Joe Louis Arena in Detroit, Michigan. This show was nominated by Adam Bodges, Jesse Alvarez, and Ron Gleason over at Patreon.com slash Wrestling with Regret. It's an historically bad show. It is ground zero for some of the worst ideas WCW ever executed, which does seem to be par for the course for Halloween Havoc every year. Now, some of you might be asking in the comments section, Brian, is this a re-upload? Haven't you done this show before? And no, I'm as surprised as you are that I've not reviewed Halloween Havoc 95 yet. I've talked about a lot of things like having to do with this show, like the Monster Truck Sumo Match and the Dungeon of Doom, but never specifically have I actually fully covered this show until now. 13,000 people at the Joe Louis Arena, roughly 7,000 paid, 120,000 pay-per-view buys and a .6 buy rate. Tony Schiavone and Bobby Heenan are on commentary. We get a little sneak peek at the monster truck match as the show begins, and we also find out that apparently Arn Anderson and Brian Pillman have attacked Ric Flair in the back before their match. Uh, let's talk about the opening hype package for a second as well. I mean, God, mid-90s WCW has really some of the best, just cheesy, so bad they're good graphics, and Halloween Havoc just has all all of them here. Oh my god. Like the face off with a tired looking Hogan somehow looking down at the giant while he's wearing a neck brace. The HH, the Hulk Hogan Gates, the spooky mansion. It's all so hokey. And the morphing of like the wrestlers and the monster trucks. It's just the best slash worst. Now I had to go back and make sure I wasn't just reviewing Spring Stampede 94 again because the opening match in this show is also Diamond Dallas Page versus Johnny B. Bad, only now it's for the TV championship which Page is defending. What a long and storied mid-card feud this has turned out to be. So weeks ago, Bad had a US title match booked against Sting, but he couldn't make it to the arena in time because he had car trouble. He had a flat tire. In the interview where he's explaining all this, DDP and his entourage walk in and Page's bodyguard Max Muscle lets it slip that all four times tires were flat, which then gave us one of the all-time great deliveries in wrestling. How did you know it was four flat tires? I said a flat tire! Bam! So yeah, since the last time I reviewed a Johnny B. Bad DDP match, Page has added a member to his entourage, not just the Diamond Doll anymore, he's also got Max Muscle in his corner, who adds really nothing to the gimmick, I don't think. Uh, DDP comes out to the ring with one of Johnny's stolen confetti guns, by the way. Out comes Johnny B. Bad, or does he? He's a stunt granny. I mean a stunt double. The real Johnny attacks from behind. They fight on the outside. Johnny grabs a bucket from someone at ringside. I don't want to know why that fan had the bucket there, but he attacks Paige with it. Bad on the offensive with some corner punches, but Paige drops him face first into the turnbuckle. A big back suplex. Paige tells the Diamond Doll to give that a 10 score, but you can tell she doesn't agree with that score. Bad fights out of a chin lock, but gets pulled down by the hair. Bobby Heenan can't stop making mechanic jokes at Johnny's expense after the whole flat tire incident. Nice assist by Max Muscle that prevents Bad from breaking out of the hold. Some blatant interference by Max allowing DDP to choke Johnny with the wrist tape. Kimberly disapproves. Bad fires back. We get a reverse atomic drop, a regular atomic drop, a head scissors, and a top rope axe handle. Kimberly gives him a 10. Johnny goes for a hip toss, but a nice counter into a DDT by Page. DDP goes for his favorite move on the planet, the diamond cutter, but it gets blocked. DDP tumbles out of the ring from the corner. Bad with a fake out to the outside. Follows up with a bad day onto both Page and Muscle. Another spring board press, a kick out, Max Muscle on the apron, interference backfires, a roll up, another kick out, wholly overbooking Batman, Max tries again, hits his own man with the clothesline, bad covers and wins and is the new TV champion. I give this one three stars out of five. I think it's a big improvement from their five minute encounter at Spring Stampede 94, for instance, but it risks going too long, kind of venturing that too long territory, a bit too much gaga near the end with Max Muscle repeatedly getting involved like he did. That being said though, I really appreciate Paige's selling in this matchup and his mannerisms, and also Johnny B. Bad slash Mark Marrow. His athleticism is always really impressive to see. He was really kind of standing out in a lot of ways from other talent at that time in that regard. One thing I forgot to mention at the top of this review 
review was that by the time Halloween Havoc rolled around, Monday Nitro was still a relatively new and fresh concept. It only debuted the previous month on TNT, and so still going strong, making waves. And one of the big angles that really formed in the beginning of uh, weeks of Nitro was between Macho Man Randy Savage and Lex Luger. They've been at odds, neither man trusting the other. At Fall Brawl, Hogan's War Games team needed a fourth man after Vader was fired from the company, and Luger was pegged as the fourth guy. Nitro Sting convinced both guys to each have a match at Halloween Havoc, and if they both won their respective matches, they'd face each other later in the night in a singles match. What a reward! Why even bother having preliminary matches in this show before they wrestle each other? Why not just have the match right away. That seems kind of silly to me. And it's not the first time I've heard of Macho having like two matches back to back on a show. He seems to do that a lot in his run in WCW. Macho Man was supposed to wrestle Kamala first on this show, but allegedly Kamala didn't want to do the job, so he quit the company just days before. So here's your contingency plan. The Zodiac, aka Brutus Beefcake. Yes, no, yes, no. One of the more bizarre eccentric members of the Dungeon of Doom, and that's really saying something. Near seconds into the match, a fan gets in the ring, Referee Randy Anderson and security work on subduing that guy as Savage and Zodiac make their way to the outside to keep the cameras on them. Very smart. Back in the ring, Zodiac slams Macho and goes for a dive, but Macho moves, hits the elbow drop, and that's it. This one gets zero stars. It's a pretty nothing match, and honestly, the most exciting thing about it was the fan getting in the ring. Uh, Savage was working with a detached tricep muscle on this show, which is the fact that he was in there at all working at any kind of level is very impressive. Didn't have to work too hard on this one. But after the match, Tony says on commentary, boy, good thing this didn't go 25 minutes. Like, Jesus, even if Savage was healthy, could you imagine 25 minutes of Savage and Zodiac? Mean Jeans backstage plugging the hotline. In comes new TV champion Johnny B. Bad, who gives a very emotional speech telling the kids that that dreams can come true, kind of planting the seeds for his current run as a motivational speaker. Gene wants to have some Greek food and sing some Little Richard in honor of Johnny Lair tonight. Up next, Road Warrior Hawk taking on the relative newcomer from Japan, Kurosawa. At Clash of Champions in Daytona Beach back in August, Kurosawa jumped Hawk after their match, gave him a hell of an arm bar, breaking his arm and putting Hawk on the shelf, leading to this grudge match. Kurosawa, better known to some as Manabu Nakanishi, is under the advisement of Colonel Robert Parker here, part of the stud stable. Nakanishi won the New Japan Young Lions Cup earlier in the year, and WCW was part of his excursion. Hawk starts off hot, hitting a gut wrench, followed up with a standard power bomb, but Kurosawa shrugs it off and is on the attack. He goes for an elbow drop, but he misses. Hawk lays into Kurosawa with a clothesline over the top, then dives off the apron onto Colonel Parker. He's a quivering! Kurosawa takes over after throwing Hawk into the ring post. It's a Samoan drop, covers with his legs on the ropes. Colonel Parker with the assist. Kurosawa wins dirty. I give it one star out of five. You know, it's a very short match, but at least it's impactful and like the short amount of time they're given. Hawk is just throwing his weight around. Looks very impressive. Just like beating the hell out of Kurosawa. And also uh, the attack on Robert Parker and the way he sells and everything. That kind of elevates it ever so slightly here. As for Kurosawa, a.k.a. Nakanishi, he would go on to have a very long career after WCW, finally retiring in February of this year. Backstage, Okerlund's with Randy Savage, who's pacing back and forth. Savage is full of interesting one-liners here, which would become infamous on Botchamania many years later. My curiosity is killing me just like a cat would be killed. By the curiosity, yeah. Well, you your are... mustache is crooked. I'm your friend. But if I ever see you in the ring, I can beat you. Don't you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Savage says he'll make sure that Lex Luger beats Mang later tonight. Spoiler alert, he's nowhere near that match, but he is all over the place in this promo, and it's just so fun to watch. It's really hard to watch this and keep a straight face. Up next, Mr. JL takes on Sabu. JL is better known as Jerry Lynn under a mask. Bobby Heenan asks, what's that stand for? Jerk and lunch? Sabu is here as part of his very, very, very short-lived stint in WCW. He only debuted one month prior and one stay around much longer after this show. He's accompanied by his uncle, the original Sheik, who's quite a big deal in the Detroit area. He wrestled in and ran that territory for many, many years to great success. The match begins, and right away the action is fast and furious. Sabu with an acai moonsault ends up hitting his own uncle in the process. He goes for another dive, but he eats shit. JL with a dive of his own. Sabu misses a moonsault. JL hits a moonsault. Sabu with a flip over the ropes and lands on JL's head with his whole ass. A German suplex off the top by JL. There's hardly any time to process what we're seeing here. Just boom, 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 spot, spot, spot. Top rope victory roll by Sabu. I've never seen that one before. JL drop kicks Sabu off the top and to the outside. Side. Sabu guillotines JL on the top, hits a springboard moonsault to win the match. And then right afterward, Sheik immediately throws his trademark fireball at JL, but the camera almost misses it. 
I give it one and a half stars out of five. You know, it's kind of a car wreck of a match in a good way and a bad way. Like, nothing gets horribly botched in this matchup, but it's so short of a match, and they're just doing spot, 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 spot. Nothing is sold. There's no time to register anything. Either as the wrestlers or the fans, and so they just kind of like blow their wad in this thing, and I guess they're trying to get as much as they can out of their whatever three or four or five minutes they have here, but it's very reminiscent of like, it's kind of ahead of its time in a way, very reminiscent of the cruiserweight matches we'll see not too long from now, which really helped define Nitro in its prime years, but it needs some serious refinement. Also, I love the fact that Sheik just could not wait until like right after the match to throw that fireball at JL, and we almost didn't see it. We take a trip to the Dungeon of Doom. The Master and the Taskmaster are on stage together. I'm not going to bother trying to recap what they say here because there's a lot of screaming. Kevin Sullivan's mouth is very moist for some reason. The gist of it is that Hulkamania will come to an end tonight and then the segment ends with him staring into the camera for an uncomfortably long time. We then go backstage, see Gene Okerlund with Hulk Hogan, Jimmy Hart, and some contest winners, and there's a guy who builds Harley Davidson's there. Yes, folks, Hulk Hogan may have embraced the dark side, but he's still happy to show up for a photo op with his fans. Here's an apparel package for the contest winner. I don't give a shit about any of this. Let's move on. Well, I should be careful what I wish for, because our next match sees Lex Luger taking on the man called Ming. Again, if Luger wins, he gets savage later in the night. Luger with the advantage early on, catapulting Meng into the corner, but Meng is very tough. Hard to keep down. Taskmaster looks kind of bored to be there, which makes sense because this match is boring to watch. Meng on the attack now even begins to bite Luger in the corner. Luger tries to come back, but Meng counters out of the suplex into a pin and is back on top. Big pile driver by Meng. It goes on like this for several minutes. It's two big, slow guys doing big, slow guy things. This match is a few minutes shorter than the TV title match that began the show, but it feels as long, if not longer, because of the pace they're working here. A brief moment of hope for Luger with a cross body, but Meng snuffs that out. Luger thrown outside and Sullivan just stares at him, not attacking. Tony openly theorizes, ooh, maybe Sullivan wants Luger to join the Dungeon of Doom. Gosh, I wonder. Luger with the suplex into the ring from the apron, but he's too weakened to capitalize. Finally knocks Meng down after a trio of clotheslines. Luger's a house of fire, signals for the torture rack, but Meng produces his golden spike. Meng jabs at Luger with it and the ref totally misses it. Suddenly, Taskmaster gets in the ring and stomps Luger mid-pin, which DQs his own man and Luger wins. What the hell? Well, this gets a half star out of five for me. It's not a fun match to get through in any sense of the word. It goes too long, the styles don't mesh well, and to top it all off, it's got a really downer, confusing ending after all that effort. I don't think I've seen like one good Lex Luger match here on the Classic Review segment. I've seen at least a couple of decent ones from Meng, so good for him, I guess. Yeah, the finish is confusing, and like, there's all this thing, where, well, you have to wait and see how the rest of the show goes, because then it makes a little bit more sense. Like, it doesn't make a ton of sense after it's all done. It makes a tiny bit more sense. But did we need a full-ass match to get to that point? Mean Gene with the Giant backstage. Giant says that 100-foot diameter circle for the Monster Truck match isn't big enough for the two of them, and once he wins, if there's anything left to Hogan, he'll choke slam Hogan through the floor to win the world title. On we go to our next match as Arn Anderson and Flying Brian Pillman take on Sting and supposedly Ric Flair, but he's been taken out with the injury as we established at the top of the show. So after several months of not wrestling, after losing a retirement match at Halloween Havoc 94, lol, Flair is reinstated later on in 95. Go watch my Great American Bash 95 review to get some more details on that. Soon after Bash at the Beach, though, he's feuding with his old friend Arn Anderson, and Arn and Brian Pillman have basically reformed the Horsemen without Ric Flair. So Flair's looking for a partner, but years of being the dirtiest player in the game means he's out of friends. He's finally able to convince longtime rival Sting to help him out in this battle, though. It happened on Nitro, and Flair and Sting were supposed to team up against Arn and Brian. I mean, the Flair was all by himself. Sting comes around and makes the save. Now on this night, the shoe's on the other foot. Sting's all by himself, and Flair's taken out with that supposed injury. Sting starts out strong. He's able to attack both men all by himself in a variety of ways, shoves Pillman off the top rope, and he clangs into the barricade. Arn then throws Sting right into Brian's head for the cutoff. It's very creative. As Arn begins to work over Sting, out comes Ric Flair, dressed in street clothes, sporting a bandage on his head. He's now officially in the match, and the fans are here for it. Flair even hits double A with one of his fancy shoes. Sting almost makes the tag, but Arn cuts him off. Again, so close to a tag, but then flying Brian distracts Flair as chased all around the ring. Brian and Arn use a lot of cheap leverage tricks to make the holds on Sting more painful. Every time Flair gets to the ring for a quick save, the crowd lights up. Sting fires up, but his 
gets hit with that oh so pretty spine buster. Sting just keeps getting worked over here as Flair's strutting and hopping around to rouse his partner. Sting drives Arn and Brian into each other. Sting finally climbs up. He tags in Flair. The crowd explodes and Flair immediately turns on Sting. Aw oh, hell it was a damn setup. The referee throws up the match. Sting tries to fight back but the numbers are too much. It was all a lie, Tony says. Flair's not hurt. It's a three on one mugging. The three men meet up with Okerlund on the stage and as Flair talks, a fan has thrown a soda cup at them. It lands perfectly between Flair's shoulder and Arn's chest. Nice. They declare the horsemen are back, reunited, and it feels so good. I give it three and a half stars out of five. This is easily the best match on the card by far. It's a fairly simple story told what's essentially a handicap match, but it's done very, very well. And I think everyone did their, filled their roles really perfectly here. And you know, in hindsight, it's easy to go, oh yeah, no shit Flair turns on Sting at the end because that's what happened. It's almost like, they, all, they almost didn't boo Flair when he turned on Sting here. It's almost kind of like, say the line, Flair turns on Sting. Yay! The crowd was super into it. And really, I think this match got the biggest reactions of any other match on this show tonight. So I think it was very satisfying to go through, even though there was that disappointing ending. As for the Horsemen, they have reunited, and soon they will round out their numbers by adding Chris Benoit. Mike Tanay is backstage with Lex Luger. Hey Lex, what do you make of that bullshit you saw in the match with Meng? Lex Luger says there are forces at play that want this match with Savage to take place. He says he'll make an example of Savage and will go through him to get to the world title. And speaking of the world champion, Hulk Hogan, let's talk about his feud with the Dungeon of Doom, specifically the arrival of the Giant. Oh boy, the Giant debuted some months ago as the kayfabe son of Andre the Giant, which they later dropped, but he's looking for revenge against Hulk Hogan. He has attacked Hogan on several occasions, injuring Hogan's neck in the process, but has yet to actually wrestle the match. At Fall Brawl, the Giant rode his giant Dungeon of Doom monster truck and obliterated Hogan's Prized Harley Davidson. The best attack that the giant levied on Hogan, though, has to take place on an episode of Nitro, where Hogan's cutting this promo and his neck brace and everything. He's in the ring, and then when he's done, he goes around the front row and starts high-fiving fans. Then he gets powdered in the face by... There's a woman! with a king! But it was actually Kevin Sullivan in a clever disguise. He and the giant beat up Hogan, giant breaks Hogan's neck again, and they shave his mustache as women and children weep. So Hogan has decided to fight fire with fire and go into the dark side, which really in the grand scheme of things doesn't make a whole lot of difference because Hogan is just wearing all black now as opposed to red and yellow. He cuts almost the exact same kind of promos he'd been doing up to this point. You know, he gets a little darker after this where he talks about bringing the, one of the head of Ming on a silver platter. But when you look at the build from like of this show itself, like there's really no difference between red and yellow Hogan and dark side Hogan. And he'll eventually drop the act at World War III. It's a really weird detour. And like a lot of people say it's kind of the closest we get to a heel Hulk Hogan before he turns the following year to join, start the NWO. But there's really no difference, it feels like. Then on the go-home Nitro, the DOD introduced their insurance policy all the way from the Himalayas, the Yete, frozen in a giant block of ice. At the very end of that Nitro, the lights flicker and out come retribution. Just kidding, the ice block breaks to reveal the Yete for like half a second before they fade to black. Ooh, what a tease. So the repeated involvement of the Dungeon of Doom monster truck prompts Hogan to make this challenge for what's called a monster truck sumo match, which is at its core the zenith of a marketing ploy set up by WCW and and some monster truck owners in an effort to try and branch out for some licensing purposes, get some more WCW branded monster trucks. As we see, there's the Dungeon of Doom, there's the Hulk Hogan one as well. This partnership ended up not really working out for either side, but whether this had anything to do with it, I'm not sure. The premise is two monster trucks are joined together at the grill and the object is to push your opponent's car completely out of the big circle. This was filmed the night before, by the way. Eric Bischoff is now in for Tony Schiavone on commentary and Bob Chandler has joined the team. He built the Hogan truck, so he's lending his expertise to the action. The wrestlers talk some trash before the rules are explained. They get in their trucks, the fight begins, and they're pushing, and pushing, and pushing, and pushing. Sing along, kids. And pushing the trucks back and forth. They just keep going. Going on forever and this thing is a bore They just keep pushing along until the giant falls off of the ledge of the building And is presumed oh. No! No! Oh my god No! Dead Zero stars
After the giant plunges to his demise, the announcers are stunned, they are shocked, they don't know what to do. Given the wart nature of it all, it seems kind of tasteless in a way. Bischoff on commentary says, you got a parking lot, you got a river, what difference does it make as far as what side he fell off of? You know, I got money in the bank earlier this year when like some people were thrown off the top of the building but not thrown completely off the building? Well, it's kind of similar here. Physically, there's no way for the giant to just fall straight off the ledge and into the river. There's like street and like building right off the ledge. He would have to have been hit with a whole Hulk Hogan Hadouken and flown off the edge in order to actually fall into the water, but none of that matters because at the end of the day, it's just a bizarre way to end this very, very weird match. As far as like the marketing ploy with the monster trucks and everything, it didn't work out, but give them credit for trying at least. Here we go, folks, a match that we had to sit through two other bad matches to get through, Lex Luger versus Randy Savage. Luger offers a handshake at the start, but Mott is having none of it. As the match begins, Jimmy Hart shows up at ringside for reasons. The announcers are barely calling this match. Bobby Heenan is yelling into his headset to try and get some updates on the giant. Luger dumps Savage to the outside, but Savage fights back. Luger's grunt game's on point here. Oh, 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 oh. Luger's got Savage pinned with the ropes, but even though the referee should clearly be able to see that, somehow he's completely mesmerized by Jimmy Hart on the apron. Savage whips Luger into Hart, who's knocked off the apron. Savage drops the elbow and wins. I give it a half star out of five. You know, for all of the time and effort WCW spent in building this matchup, not just on the weekly programming, but also on the pay-per-view itself, kind of a lackluster spectacle. You know, again, the credit goes to Savage for working with a very serious arm injury, so that should be taken into account. But I mean, the fact that we have these preliminary matches to, to get to this point seems kind of silly. Oh, but don't worry, because it's apparently supposed to all make sense in the main event. Meanwhile, the brain is so upset over a lack of information, he gets up from the announce table to figure it out himself, then he immediately comes back. He's even on his hands and knees begging for an update. Well, don't worry, Bobby, you'll get your resolution soon, because it's time for our main event. We go from machine versus machine to man versus man. Hulk Hogan will defend his WCW championship against the Giant, assuming he survived that fall from the roof of Cobo Hall. Hogan is not dressed to compete and looks very somber here. On the mic, Hogan apologizes for what happened after the truck fight, but then the Dungeon of Doom's music plays and the Giant appears, looking fresh as a daisy, not looking hurt in any way. It's never explained why this happened other than, oh, he's superhuman. Okay, let's roll with it then. It is maddening to me that they never really properly addressed this or showed any kind of thing to reconcile why this is happening. He just shows up, he looks fine, and that's that. On 83 Weeks, talking about this show, Eric Bischoff tries to defend what goes on here, but he does a really bad job of it. He's like, well, you know, WWF did something really similar the previous year with The Undertaker being you know, killed off and resurrected you know, back in 94. And yeah, that's an example of that. And you also say, he also says, oh, they had better production value than WCW. It's like WCW still had a lot of money in their coffers. They could have you know, invested in some blinking lights or a smoke machine or something to try and show the process of the giant being resurrected or like how he somehow survived that. But they could have done literally anything to show that process and instead they did nothing which I think is a real big disservice. They just kind of expected fans to figure it out for themselves. You know, it just shows a glaring lack of continuity and I know it's a lot to ask of wrestling to have some continuity and have things make sense. This would have been a good show. If they had done literally anything to show the process of Giant surviving and like getting back up or whatever, I would have bought that. You could have cut to a shot of him like in the wreckage and then you see like the hand go up or something. It would have been so easy to film that and they just didn't do it. They, they had no lights, no, no smoke. Smoke and mirrors. That's literally all I'm asking for is smoke and mirrors, folks. So the match begins. Hogan removes the bandana to reveal he also has face paint similar to the Taskmasters. Still no idea what that's supposed to represent. I guess that's the darkness. As the match goes on, I'm thinking, imagine if you only knew Hulk Hogan from like his run in the 80s or the NWO days or the comeback in 2002 and you weren't really aware of his like pre-NWO stuff in WCW. Like if you just knew him as the red and yellow or like the full-on Hollywood Hogan. If you started watching this match and you saw Hulk Hogan in all black and red cowboy boots with some black paint on his head, you know, no mustache, what is this Hulk Hogan? For his first pro match, the Giant looks pretty good for the most part. A couple of times things can get a little clunky, but I mean, if anybody can carry Giant to a good David Goliath matchup, it's Hogan. 
Hogan. Giant's working over Hogan with several chokes in the corner, turns into a test of strength, and it's all Giant. He slams Hogan, goes for an elbow drop, but he misses. Hogan hulks up, multiple clotheslines, and the Giant finally goes out of the ring, but the big man's not going down easily. It's a big backbreaker on the Hulkster. This match goes on for entirely too long. There's a big bear hug into another big body slam into another bear hug. Hogan's fighting back, but he runs right into a goozle and a big choke slam. I do love Giant's early choke slams when he comes down with it, by the way. Hogan kicks out and hulks up again. The punches, the boot, Giant's still standing, a picture-perfect body slam and leg drop, but wait, Jimmy Hart decks the referee with the title belt. Hogan doesn't know what's happening. He tells Jimmy to help out. Hart dumps the ref and decks Hogan with the belt. Hogan isn't phased, goes to attack Hart for the betrayal. The Giant attacks with the bear hug again. Tony yells, did Jimmy Hart fall off the roof and hit his head? I love that line. Hart's beckoning for someone to come to the ring. It's Lex Luger and Randy Savage, but Jimmy hits Savage now. And the Yeti! Luger is stomping Savage. And then the Yeti comes in the ring and gives us one of the most iconic moments in all of professional wrestling, the dreaded double bear hug. The giant and Ron Reese wrapped up in dirty toilet paper with the double dry hump onto Hogan. And then Luger is the torture rack onto Hogan, then the Savage. And in the end, the giant is declared the winner by disqualification, but Michael Buff announces the title cannot change hands on a DQ. Oh, how wrong he is, but more of that in a minute. Great call by Hina when he says, warm up the bedpan, Hogan's going to the hospital. This one gets negative one star out of five for me. I mean, I've watched this match a few times over the years, and it never gets any less confusing the more I watch it. And if anything, it gets more confusing. What a clusterfuck of an ending that is. Jimmy Hart turns heel on Hulk Hogan. Lex Luger then turns heel and joins the Dungeon of Doom. The Yeti shows up, which is great. Ha ha, that's, that's very humorous. But you almost never see him again in that form. He turns into the super giant ninja sometime after this. And that's a whole other thing. They announced like two nights later on Nitro that Jimmy Hart wrote into Hogan's match contract. Contract. The title can change hands on a DQ, which is what so the giant becomes the champion. But then he's he's t the, the belt's taken off him because of Jimmy Hart's interference, and it's all so fucking confusing. The idea is you're supposed to make more sense of the Lex Luger stuff building up to this matchup after you see what happens here in this main event, but it doesn't help at all. If anything, the one thing you can say, oh, that makes sense, is when Sullivan doesn't attack Luger on the outside in the match with Meng and does kind of help Luger win, but they had to go through that whole fucking match, that awful, god-awful match to get there. It's all so sloppy and confusing. Maybe I'm not enough of a galaxy brain to figure out what, what Kevin Sullivan was thinking when he wrote this stuff, but all this whole thing just looks so sloppy and confusing in the aftermath, and even with the foresight of knowing what's going to happen, I still am sitting watching this stuff on, early in the show going, why? This doesn't make sense. None of this makes sense. But then again, they did give us the Yeti, so I guess there's that. My grade for Halloween Havoc 1995 is an F. Yes, I graded it worse than 91, which is an F+. This is an awful, awful show. There's like two like decent to good matches here. That's literally it. Everything else is so bad. The whole thread with Savage and Luger is super confusing. Machine versus a machine, man versus man. Neither of those are good. The whole clusterfuck ending to that main event. The Yeti, I mean, wow. This is just a whole bunch of bad being thrown at your face for two and a half hours. It truly was the worst of times for WCW. Nobody looked good as a result of this show. Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of Halloween Havoc 95. If you want to play a role in determining which shows I look at, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate classic shows for me to review. Next time we are doing Halloween Havoc once again, we're going to go two years into the future, Halloween Havoc 1997. At least there's Ray and Eddie to keep us happy. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. And pushing the trucks back and forth It just keeps going on forever And they're not keeping score They just keep pushing along Until the giant falls off of the ledge of the building And is presumed dead Wait, what?